Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to the drive through RPG review, my written and video view series. We take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at drivethroughrpg.com. This video will be reviewing the Adventure Collection Adventures from the Potbellied Kobold, designed by Jeff Stevens Games, with writing by Alan Tucker, Alex Klippinger, Catherine Evans, Cody Falk, Greg Marks, Hannah Rose, James Introcaso, Gene Headley, Jeff C. Stevens, JVC Perry, Kat Kruger, Maxine Henry, Mike Shea, M.T. Black, Oliver Darkshire, Sean Merwin, Ta Tony Winslow Brill, and Tony Petraka for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my videos and streams, consider using my affiliate links for your online shopping and supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. I just uh, rattled off some of the biggest and best names in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition adventure design. By the way, there's a lot of really great names attached to this product, uh, which was a successful Kickstarter campaign and is similar to, I would say, Candlekeep Mysteries. Candlekeep Mysteries uh, released earlier this year and included 17 kind of mini adventures that were all tied together that had to do with books. This one doesn't have anything to do with books. Well, one of them does. Um, but it's just a collection of small one-shot adventures. All of them are um, fewer than 10 pages long, and they're all designed for to last you know, a f one session, which is fewer than three or four hours. Um, there are 15 adventures that are included here, which means this entire product is over 170 pages long, which also includes over 30 NPC stat blocks. It's on drive through RPG, so you won't get anything that's found in that's you know, uh, actual IP from D&D. &D. You can obviously use stuff that's from the SRD. But what we get instead is a lot of stuff from Cobalt Press's um, Tomb of Beasts and the Creature Codex, which um, thankfully are also included here in this product, which is awesome. Um, as well as four backgrounds. All of these adventures have maps, which is incredible. Um, the adventures are all Tier 1 and Tier 2, which is a little different from Candlekeep Mysteries, which goes away to Tier 3. I will admit that's a little disappointing. I was hoping we would, you know, I, I'm aware that we don't see most D and D games probably don't even reach, you know, tier three and tier four level of play. And I'm sure wizards has all that information. And I know a lot of designers are thinking, well, that's where most D and D is being played. So that's the kind of adventures we're going to formulate. And I think that's fine, but I would have preferred, um, had we taken a route that was more like, let's do maybe a maximum of two adventures per level. And then we can get up there to some higher levels just because there are some cool, um, you know, new toys in the toy box you can play with if you're reaching those levels in more fantastical settings. And I really want to see the extra design challenge to trying to uh, come up with a one-shot adventure that's fewer than 10 pages that would involve, you know, heroes that are of that stature that aren't already part of a, a huge overarching campaign that, you know, somebody could slot that in as a side quest, which is really what a lot of these are. It's like, you know, side quest adventures that have their own little beginning, middle, and end, and you can drop them into whatever adventure that you're using. Some of them might require you be in an urban setting and others is more of a, you know, pastoral village or in a cave um, or in one of them, it's um, somebody is kidnapped by a cloud giant. So you actually end up flying up there to the cloud giant base. Um, there's a lot of and there's a lot of really great variety in the type and genre of adventures that we will see here. There are, you know, role playing heavy adventures that involve a lot of social encounters. There are traditional dungeon crawls. There are some mystery investigations. It's a lot of really cool ideas. So it's not all just one type of adventure. And all of them have maps. And you know how much I love my maps. <laughs> Somebody who plays on a virtual tabletop for 90% of my D&D experience, having maps ready to go, full color, detailed, um, non-gridded. Uh, I, I believe the grid maps are embedded here in the product, but you've got um, non-gridded maps uh, that are included as separate image files and VTT tokens for you know the ones that they have access to so you can't use you know the actual like art from the monster manual for example but any kind of other art that's actually included in this um uh adventure like this picture of this gargoyle here it would be included as a as a token that's just ready to slot into something like roll 20 which is really awesome so i really appreciate the extra love and attention paid to us uh virtual tabletop players um i'm gonna attempt to kind of skim through each of these adventures if you really want to know what they're all about i'm not going to do like a big deep dive because there are 15 of them and i am trying to get this review done in you know 20 or 30 minutes um but i'm going to go over them at least on the surface level i'm going to say at the start 
This is a really great collection and it's a really high quality across the board, which is really what I expected once I started reading off some of these names. Um, I don't think there was a single adventure I read that I was like, well, oh, that doesn't sound very interesting or that this sounds really badly designed or something. Like, I honestly didn't feel that way about any of the adventures. Now, I did like some of them more than others, for sure. And a couple of them were like, oh, this is just an amazing idea. I love it. Um, you know, it wasn't like I felt that way for every single adventure, but none of them that I really feel were just completely ho-hum. Like, it's a really, really impressive um, quality level throughout the entire collection. There is a little bit in the introduction about, you know, how to be a good game master and how to use the actual Potbelly Cobalt. So anytime I see a a product that is that has a person's an, an in-universe person's name attached to it, it's Mordenkainen's or it's some whatever the designer's little wizard person is. Um, I'm always curious to see what does that actually mean? Are you just are you just being cutesy with the name of the product and then it's they don't actually matter? Or is this actually like a character that appears in the like margins or something? Or, you know, how does how does it actually convey in the product? In this case, um, the pop Cobalt Cobalt doesn't uh, interfere with any of the actual adventures. Like she's not, you know, writing the margins or anything. Um, instead, she attempts to link the adventures together into a one big kind of campaign that you could play just by putting a bunch of these um, adventures, which it, these adventures don't have anything to do with each other. I think they were all, you know, designed separately by different um, writers. So they're all just, and it, it, they didn't have the, the the connection of, they're all based on books or something, because that's something that Kenneth Kate Mysteries did. Um, in this case, they're just all, you know, kind of generically good adventures, I guess. And what the uh, pop Billy Cobalt does, she's a, a, a transformed, she's been cursed. She's a gnome wizard, was cursed by her rival wizard. And she's got this magic book, which can alert to different dangers and important things happening kind of nearby. And she basically becomes the party's quest giver uh, and can dictate them to each of these uh, different quests, which is a fine idea. I think that's great. It's not, you know, super complex. It doesn't have this huge storied history or anything. It's not meant to be its own story. It's just, hey, here's a way you can link these adventures together. It only links 10 of them. And I think a part of the reason for that is because you you don't need to be playing like five different third level adventures. You're just going to level out of that, right? Which, again, is why I wished we had gotten more better level range. We might have been able to include all of them in one big campaign, kind of like you can do for Candlekeep, even though there's no connection there, um, because that actually goes to level 15, I believe. Or maybe, does it go up to 16? Maybe it goes up to 16. Um, but anyway, it only connects 10 of these here, but it does a, a fine job. It includes rewards. It says what kind of magic items are included and um, essentially becomes this little fun Where's Waldo thing where she needs an ingredient from each of these different adventures that you can acquire. And if you do, if you collect all these ingredients, presumably she'll be able to cure herself of the curse. Now, why you give a shit about this transform cobalt? I don't know. You're going to have to buy into that. It's, you know, we, do you want to play D&D or not? <laughs> Uh, so I, I do appreciate that that was extra mile was given to try to tie these adventures together because so often, including with Candlekeep Mysteries, I know I mentioned that a lot, um, there's no effort given to actually trying to narratively tie these together. Like what if you want to run this one after this one after this one? So I think that's uh, very cool and thumbs up to that. All right. So briefly going over these adventures, I had to write them down in my notes because again, 170 pages and 15 freaking adventures. Tinker Taylor Goblin Die is actually one of my favorites. Um, just because, you know, there's only so many things you can see with the low-level dungeon crawl. And this one kind of reminded me a little bit of the one in Candlekeep Mysteries where you go to the extra-dimensional um, man manor and there's just a bunch of, like, things there that can attack you. This one's similar to that, although I didn't feel like it necessarily, you know, copied or stepped on its toes or anything like that, because I like the fact that all of the constructs that are in this manner are potentially friendly. You can actually socialize with them if you can come up with a way to communicate, which is pretty fun. They're basically all on the defensive. Um, this uh, halfling thief came in to this uh, abandoned manor that used to belong to this dragonborn who was a very eccentric wizard who had all these animated objects that were his friends. And um, started robbing the place and forged a deed and sold it to somebody else. And that person's like, okay, go in and check out this manor. And you go in there and the ghost is there, but he's not really a, a factor. It's more of these uh, constructs. There's an animated armor. There's a mimic, which is a desk. There's an awakened tree. There's a gargoyle. Just It kind of covers a lot of those boxes. And those are all pretty powerful things to throw at a level two party. So the idea is 
you you be pretty obvious with these things, right? Like the tree is in the middle of the dining room. This giant fucking tree just like sitting in the middle of the dining room. You're like, what the hell is going on? And there's a desk like curled up in the garden, like in a corner. And it starts to clue the players in and maybe they can interact with things. And, and all these objects are very defensive. They're very kind of scared about what's going on. So I think that's a really cool twist about how you can work around that. And you could even play the whole thing without a single combat encounter, which I think is really, really interesting. So just very good at checking the exploration box um, really well. And, you know, again, there's not only so many things you can do at um, second level. We, we actually just skip past first. There's no first level adventures here, which I'm fine with through first level. It's a tutorial anyway. Um, second level adventure, really, really well designed. Uh, Into the Clouds involves a one-armed cloud giant who has kidnapped a, uh, a carpenter, um, a person who can craft things, and uh, he's commanding her to make him a new arm, and then he will animate that arm, and that will be his new arm, basically. And that's kind of the whole thing. There's not much um, story, but I think it's impressive that you can... This is an example of how you can take what would normally be a very high-level threat and put it at, like, level 3, and the idea is you have to um, kind of treat it like the old, uh, like Jack and the Beanstalk or or Mickey and the Beanstalk, which was the one I always watched, where there's obviously a huge powerful threat that you can't, don't want to fight, but you have to do something else. In other words, you have to sneak past him. You have to stealthily take his ring of feather fall off of him so you can all escape from the uh, Cloud Giant base. Um, you, you can reason with him and use social encounters. There is still some combat involved. There's like a random encounter earlier on that you can do that kind of teases what happened. And then a bunch of animated hippogriffs at the beginning that um, attack you. There's an interesting puzzle with a bunch of ball lightning um, braziers that you have to solve a little puzzle to open the door. So for having such a small uh, dungeon and a fairly simple plot, I think it does, you know, it checks all those boxes fairly well. And I like the fact that you have to deal with this cloud giant where obviously you don't want to fight a cloud giant at like third level. That's probably not going to go well for you. Um, the artwork and, lay, uh, artwork and layout throughout is, I, I kind of have mixed feelings about it. It's, it's probably the, one of the few negatives I have about this entire product. It, you know, I really like the adventures. Um, I love the maps. The textual layout is a little problematic for me because I think it's they do this weird font style that makes it look kind of muddy and uh, it's hard to tell what's bolded and that really runs into a problem when it comes to like, you know, like the words, if it's a saving throw or something that should pop out, doesn't really pop out very well. And especially when it comes to creatures, it's really hard to pick out where it's supposed to tell me where the creatures are and how many there are. There have been a couple times where I was reading an adventure going, okay, wait, where did those ghouls come from? How many were there? Because it just doesn't do a good job of organizing and, and really like, you know, putting them in boldened because I feel like the entire text just I don't know, it just doesn't work very well in, in the in the layout and the whole like, you know, red on black on, you know, the red um, subheadings on the black text with the brown background. It's a little nitpicky, but it's enough to where it does bug me, honestly, um, with the textual layout. And some of the art layout isn't that wonderful either. This one is really good, but there are others that just, it's just kind of a square like picture photo that's not embedded very well in the um, actual adventure just doesn't quite fit. And obviously there's a ton of different kinds of art styles, which you kind of get that feeling from having anthologies. That's a bit of a problem um, with, you know, everybody using different art and things. So um, just general layout, you know, I, I think the art, a lot of the art that's used here is fun and I do love the maps, but I do have some layout quibbles here and there. I think I skipped through some adventures. Um, Redeemed with Fire seems like a really hard one to pull off because it involves a criminal mastermind who's after your party. Um, and for, for third, for third level, I can't imagine your parties have made too many enemies yet, but, uh, if they have, and you've got an urban adventure in mind, this can be a really interesting one where this criminal mastermind, um, has embroiled your party into this plot of this noble family whose daughter is run away and wants to be an entertainer, dancer, I guess exotic dancer is what I was meant to assume. Um, and you kind of travel to these different establishments and you're trying to do some investigation work. And ultimately, um, it just leads to kind of a typical like, oh, she's actually in distress and you've walked into a trap by this villain. So it's a weird thing for a, a one shot to do because it relies so much on having like a memorable villain that you can use and then spring a trap on the party. Um, but being an urban adventure, we're investigating the, uh, basically a missing person. I think it works out uh, pretty well. Blue Moon is kind of a standard dungeon crawl, but I like that the dungeon is a cemetery in a swamp, and the cemetery itself has this magical feature where it only it rises out of this swamp every uh, couple of years, I think, or something, and then or maybe it's every 
day. I don't remember the, sorry, there's been a lot of adventures. Uh, it's every so often the fucking thing rises and falls. Anyway, um, and your goal is to gather these sacred bones from this certain leader, from this other faction before they get there and basically take her out of their exhume. Um, it, it's, it's sanctioned grave robbing. And of course it's a, you know, cemetery full of danger. You've got some ghouls feasting on stuff. Um, there's a really cool pathway of like nasty, evil trees are going to grab you and scratch you. There's a fun, uh, I, I really like the fact that there's a, like a side quest in the one shot where there's a friendly ghoul who's like, Hey, I shouldn't be buried here. Bury me over there. And the players have to make all these skill checks to be able to help him out. Um, and the interesting thing, the, the thing I love about this adventure is there's a table you're supposed to roll on. Um, every time your party spends too long, every time they do an encounter too long or they decide to rest or something, there's a literal ticking clock to when this whole place starts sinking again. And it's supposed to be that once you start getting up there, you can see that you get minus 10 feet to your speed, disadvantage versus cold damage, and then eventually like even layer actions that are trying to restrain you as the whole thing is like halfway sinking into the mud. That's a really cool feature and puts a whole timetable on it because that's such a big thing in D&D, right? Is otherwise you could stop and long rest after every fight. Well, how do you make time matter in a lot of these adventures? So I thought that was a really great way of making this a more challenging adventure. And then the end is a really cool epic fight between this other faction that shows up at the end and just has this big um, boss fight, right? When you're trying to solve the puzzle of getting these, um, of opening the right tomb. So really cool adventure. Clunk Spindles, Clockwork Conundrum. Um, MT Black is quickly becoming one of my favorite uh, dungeon designers for sure after just reviewing, shoot, I can't remember the name of it now. Um, Tomb of the Twilight Queen, I believe. Uh, just recently, like last month, or I think. Um, really awesome puzzle and trap filled dungeon just has a really great eye for dungeon design. That's really memorable. And, you know, it, it's, it elevates the whole, like, you know, Oh, four rooms, room to room. We're just going to fight. You know, there's the one fight, there's the one puzzle, there's the one boss fight and we're done. Um, this one is an insane 19 room, crazy big clockwork dungeon that really reminds me of like the gears of hate from the tomb of the nine gods. And like really a lot of the best des design dungeons that I've seen. Um, there's not much in the way of story. Basically, this person stole a thing and you have to go rescue the thing which has been taken into this place. That's basically the whole story. But this dungeon is incredible. There's so many cool things and puzzles and levers and gears and things that it you you, you there'll be a room. It's like mist almost where there's like you know, nothing but a, a single lever in a room and you'll pull it and you'll hear something happening somewhere else. You're like, what the fuck is going on? And it turns out you just retracted a bridge further in the further in the dungeon or you, you know, it's an adventure game. Like you found an item you're going to need somewhere else. And yes, there's still combat. There's still some really great puzzles. There's a whole lot of traps. Just a fucking really cool uh, dungeon design with a lot of really neat ideas. And I wonder if the designer looked through Cobalt Press's uh, Tomb of Beasts, saw a bunch of clockwork enemies and thought, I'm doing a whole clockwork dungeon because it uses a lot of those clockwork enemies. Now, if you don't have the Tomb of, or if you don't have Tomb of Beasts, all these stat blocks are included in the supplement, which is awesome. So I, I'm not going to include that as a con because... Um, if you don't have the stat blocks, they're here. Like you, there's no excuse not to use them, which is amazing. And I think it's a great use of those different stat blocks, uh, as well. And it does have scaling suggestions for different level parties, pretty much like plus or minus, maybe like one level or so, but it does have some hints about, Hey, how, you know, if you add more enemies or subtract this many hit points or remove these enemies, you can do that for pretty much all these encounters. I believe all of these adventures have those scaling suggestions, which is pretty nice. Even though I find these this weird purple stat block to be, or this weird purple sidebar to be very jarring and misplaced. <laughs> um, but really, really awesome, cool idea, full of puzzles, neat ideas. Absolutely use this dungeon in your campaigns. If you ever want to use a clockwork dungeon or just some of these puzzles, this alone is probably worth the price of admission, to be honest. Just a fucking awesome dungeon. Uh, Murder at Sable Mansion, Oliver Darkshire makes some of the most memorable adventures uh, through the DMs Guild and Drive Through RPG, and this is a great one. This one basically, I don't even want to spoil it because it's so good. Um, it 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 combines Clue, like the movie Clue, with um, uh, is Tim? I think Tim Curry's in that movie. I haven't seen that movie in forever, but it's a really fun movie. Actually, had like multiple endings and stuff where everybody's running around. There's people getting murdered. Um, it combines that with like John Carpenter's The Thing, which is kind of like a horror version of Clue in a way where it's, you know, somebody, it's a whodunit and it's, but in, in The Thing, it's somebody can keep morphing and changing their appearance. Um, in this case, it is a murder. It's very much even based on Clue. It's got like the colonel and the madam and the professor and all those. Um, but the instigator is a doppelganger who can, of course, pose as anybody. And the designer does a really interesting thing where... The who done it is left up to the DM. It's it's like hey, anybody could do it. That's what makes these adventures so cool. Like, it doesn't have like this strict like, 
you know, Sherlock Holmes style plot where the party has to try to figure that stuff out because that can be, some parties can enjoy that, but it can also be a big turnoff if the party, if the party isn't getting it. Instead, it's meant to be more of a role playing in, encounter where you're talking to all these people. They all have different secrets and hangups, like the Colonel secretly a werewolf. Um, the, uh, the, the maid is secretly a ghoul. And she's all creepy and eventually tries to like feast on somebody and you're not even sure who did it like it really is up to you as the dm to decide okay who went nuts and killed people and i mean the doppelganger did it but the doppelganger could be any of them basically is what i'm trying to say so it's a really fucking awesome idea it could be entirely social or it could be it could be a horror movie you know where it starts out like seemingly okay and then weird things start happening and then all of a sudden just shit hits the fan and it's just crazy and everybody's tearing each other up and stuff it just has a potential to be really really amazing cool ideas uh that is the murder at sable mansion awesome 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 idea uh so much so that i'm probably in, too intimidated to run it although i think it'd be really cool to run a kind of dinner party murder mystery style adventure the slime cave of norwal is a probably one of the more traditional adventures here it's very much a DD dungeon crawl i like the twist that the cultists are um trying to uh like wave off the fact that they're cultists which i think is pretty funny so you have a chance of um uh basically making your way through there in more of a social situation rather than a room uh, room to room combat fight i get kind of a ghostbusters vibe from this one almost because there's a part where you meet like a ghost who's trapped and he was part of the um cabal that is trying to summon this slime god and you can kind of work with him to try and you know figure out what to do and and save the day from all these slimes in the slime cave so pretty cool idea neat little story happening two heads are better than one um this one is all about a necromancer who has decided to flicker my pages why is it doing that okay um this is, this is such a big thing my pdf reader is just buckling um you follow the trail to this necromancer's cave and uh there's you know a bunch of undead in the way and the main thing is he has it's kind of creepy. He's trying to create a oh, an ogre etten, ogre zombie etten, zombie etten. I guess what I'm trying to say because ogre zombies already exist, and he's using ogre zombies and then sewing an additional head onto the body to try to create an etten, essentially. Um, that's you know undead. Um, the big twist in this one, and all that's fine. The big twist is that when you get to the final boss, who is a zombified um, ogre with an attached second head, which is creepy, that second head is actually the fucking necromancer. And he's like, oh, God, save me. There's a scroll from Vi back in my lab, and you need to defeat this guy and do it. That's a really fun twist, and I did appreciate that. Otherwise, this one would be a pretty standard, um, which, no, there's anything wrong with that, but a pretty standard dungeon crawl with a bunch of um, undead in the middle. But I like the fact that one of them is just screaming and freaking out the whole time. That could be make for a really memorable role-playing encounter with an otherwise um, harrowing boss fight with a fairly powerful, basically souped-up ogre zombie. The instability of isolation has one of the more memorable settings for an adventure, which is like a healing house um slash like retirement home for adventures which is a really cool idea and something i never even thought of that would be you know in some kind of either town or or big city um and there's something creepy going on here so you're trying to figure out why people are losing their memories and some people are acting the right are acting the right way it's almost like kind of a version of cocoon or something um and it turns out there's this really creepy creature, which I don't know if it's unique to this adventure or not. It might be because it's listed right after the, it's not listed at the end of the appendix. So it might be a unique new creature called the Skittering Haunt, which is kind of like a spider version of an Ublex where it's like it drains people and then it can create um, a facsimiles of those people, but it has the tendril webs connected to it. And it's kind of puppeting some of these people just living beneath this facility, like slowly spreading itself throughout. And it's a really creepy, you know, obviously a very much about investigation, role playing with all these people. And then you dive down and figure out, oh God, there's this really creepy, you know, thing that's doing all this. So you could play a lot of these adventures, almost like a horror story if you wanted to, with the way it um, unfolds with some of these stories. So that one's a neat idea. Uh, how are we doing on time? Okay. Race for the crown. Um, you're working with a bunch of orcs to, you've kind of both sides have been manipulated to free this demon, essentially. Um, you have to solve this kind of complex puzzle and you're racing across. You can fight the orcs or you can work with them. Um, and at the end, if you kind of think you're doing the right thing and, and put this crown together, then you end up releasing this giant demon. Whoops. Now you're going to fight the giant demon. Um, the Orb of Envy is about a princess who was corrupted by an orb and she was transformed into a dragon, kind of like Shrek. <laughs> I feel like every transformed polymorph dragon is like Shrek. Um, the interesting thing about this one is the tower is the dungeon. It's not very big, but you can meet the various NPCs that the dragon princess has, um, I guess, mind controlled. And 
it behooves you very much to try to free them of that control because they will straight up join you in forces against her. So that makes a big deal in terms of the power that you have um, going up against the dragon versus having to fight all these people and then making it up to fight the dragon. And if you destroy the orb, which the orb itself has stats, then you free everybody, including the dragon of this curse, which I really like a boss fight that has other things going on. So you're not just fighting a dragon. You're trying to survive against a dragon while destroying this orb to free everybody. So... I do really like that uh, twist in there that everybody's essentially cursed and there's a, a good way of solving this mission, which isn't just to kill the dragon and kill everybody inside, although that's always an option, but is to actually free them from the curse. The Athenaeum of Dust could very well be an adventure from Candlekeep Mysteries. Uh, it starts with a book. You open the book and you are teleported to this extra dimensional library, which has just a, a maze and stacks and stacks of books. I love that the automaton, which is an adorable picture um is named dewey and he's got his buddy named dickinson who has gone rogue and is just this berserk automaton roaming around and there's all these different like entities you can meet there's a dragon that uh, a flame dragon that continuously burns all these books but the books keep you know coming back together and it just gets slowly pissed off from that and there's a hag who creates these creepy wax creatures like in any other wing and summons them at you it's kind of a fish out of water story where you just teleport to this world and you're trying to figure out how the fuck to get out of here and you have to do all these things and then eventually you know get the mask together and kind of hit all these different places to make it to the exit to escape uh would have made a really really great candle keep mysteries adventure just because it starts with you being teleported from a book um uh, but in any case it's, it's also a really good drop-in adventure for that reason because you can just teleport to this area and now you're trying to escape from this place shattered grace is kind of like two dungeon crawls in one there's a big long backstory with the villain which not a lot of these adventures have that they typically just say okay there's a villain you know waiting at the end but this one actually does go and explain um a lot about their villain who is this uh used to be a consort of a king and um she was betrayed her kids were murdered she sold herself to a demon i guess transformed into a lamia which is a half tiger person and has now uh, basically gone after all royal heirs and she kills them all and then eventually she didn't kill one and uh, that one decided to uh, or convinced her like hey instead of killing everybody why don't you just um, kidnap them and then change their identity and then eventually they can reveal themselves and that will cause the entire monarchy to crumble and will you know break the establishment from the inside and you know that background's fine um the actual adventure is basically dungeon crawl which is kind of two dungeons in one you have to fight your way through a bunch of caves uh knoll caves filled with knolls and including an old chieftain who's got this altar and they pray to the same god as lemia the demon and um once you defeat him that actually you now you can see how the hidden area is all these flying earth moats above the knoll dungeon which is cool i usually picture you somehow have to keep going forward and you go down deeper in this case, you go back to the entrance, you look up, and all of a sudden there's all these flying rocks and temples built on the rocks, which is a really neat kind of, you know, second half of this dungeon crawl, which results in fighting or working with the Lemmy at the end. It might be possible that you hear her story and, and join up with her, but I just think that's a neat dungeon design. Spare Parts involves another missing person, but this time it's a missing body who's gone missing, and uh, it's a very much an urban adventure that you do a lot of investigative work, and it's a town that has flesh golem fights like robot wars or something where they just pit these flesh golems against each other so you can kind of see where i'm going with this already like somebody obviously took the body and is you know the flesh golems gotta come from somewhere the funny twist is the body was legally like paid for and sold and everything after it was given to the morgue so you kind of have a weird moral quandary of like well do we actually have a leg to stand on here i mean it is kind of weird that you guys are doing this but everything's kind of kosher so um, more of a um, role-playing investigative uh, situation, although you can certainly come to blows in this one as well. And then I believe we're at the end with TikTok, which is a, a ninth level adventure. And by the way, I, I kind of forgot to say the levels, but we've been going from second level up till ninth level now. Most of them, many of them fall in that three, four, five, six range. Um, once we get up to this one at ninth level, TikTok, you are transported from a cabin um, with a clock and you are teleported inside the clock into a very unique dungeon crawl that's all about time like time is still in one things um, there's of course a room filled with the sands of time you can meet a bunch of time elementals and time methods that can operate in things there's one that's like a mirror image of you that can operate in other areas that the whole rooms keep going forward and there's different restrictions and rules it's a very complicated but very interesting way to design a dungeon and it really goes hard with a the time theme in, in some really cool ways which i appreciate 
And that is this whole adventure in or anthology in 30 minutes. We also get the uh, huge appendix, which includes all of the Cobalt Press creatures, which thank goodness, because that would be very painful if it used a bunch of cool creatures and you didn't have, you know, Tomb of Beasts. So I'm very thankful these are all included here. And then apparently as a Kickstarter reward, we got some additional um, character backgrounds, which are never that exciting in 5e, if I'm being honest. They just don't usually play into the much, but um, they're nice to have. A barber, bodyguard, a butcher, and vagabond are the four, and they all do have all the, the tables, which are the fun parts that I like reading. Personality traits, flaws, bonds, and ideals. So just a really, really awesome uh, product. Probably one of the best products of the year. I wish the physical layout was a little bit more attractive, but honestly, the maps, the adventures, the quality is all really, really fantastic. Uh, let's go over my pros and cons for adventures from the Potbellied Cobalt. Pros, 15 short but excellent mini adventures covering a wide variety of genres and play styles. Pro, optional overarching quest chain starring the titular Cobalt loosely ties 10 of the adventures together. I really like that that extra... Um, uh, uh, level was given that extra care to try and tie those things together, which is fantastic. Um, pro encounter scaling suggestions and alternate options from Tomb of Beasts and Creature Codex with 30 plus stat blocks included at the end of the supplement. Yay! Uh, each adventure features a full color detailed battle map plus NPC and monster tokens. Thank you so much for doing that. That is amazing and that helps elevate this entire product to a whole nother level for me and for many of us who play on virtual tabletops and just enjoy good maps in general. As I was flipping through the entire booklet, you could see all of these maps are very high quality and you could throw those right on the virtual tabletop and play all these adventures. And Final Pro, four character backgrounds, always appreciated. My cons, uh, the unattractive font and text layout that specifically makes it hard to pinpoint and differentiate between um, like where, like what kind of NPCs are we dealing with, what kind of monsters, how many are there. It really is kind of hard for me to actually parse some of this information uh, to the point where I, I blame a lot of the like font and text that was used. And the other con is that's only tier one and tier two adventures. I was really hoping we'd get a little bit more of a wider variety. I still like the actual variety of genres and styles, but I wish we could have gotten a few more higher tier adventures just to see what some of these designers could do with the restriction of like, you know, only 10 pages. How do we design a cool and memorable higher level thing? I'm not even talking about level 16, but like give me some, you know, 11 and 12 and 13 or something. Final verdict. Investigate a home for retired adventurers, solve a murder mystery at a noble manor, survive a clockwork dungeon crawl, and much more in this excellent collection of short and sweet one-shot adventures. Thank you to everyone for watching this very meaty video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com. You can watch more reviews and follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel, and you can support my work at patreon.com slash Rogue Watson. Shouts to Platinum Patrons, Joe, Will, Tiny Dancer, Christopher Thomas, Captain Mike, Adam, Stan, Nathan, Alex, Cam, William, I'm Loud, and Gold Patrons, RPG, Papercrafts, Pretty Boy, and Yuma, Marcus, Dead Lizard Lounge, Sam, Aras, Lumpy, Spuds, Jerome, Sklenny, Nick, Farty Mc, Butterpants, Blood Angel, Vornis, Baboon, Baboon, Nathan, Fantastic, Tortoise, and James. Thank you all very much for your support.